Hey guys and welcome back to a new episode of Philips Android News, this time for February 2024. This is the format where I take some time once a month and condense all important changes that affect us native Android developers, whether that is a change in Google Play, a new Jetpack Compose version, a new Kotlin version, a new Android Studio version, or just cool new libraries that we can now use in our projects. Because I know that staying up to date in this fast-paced tech world is not easy and it takes time and you as an android developer can just watch this once a month and then decide for yourself which topic makes sense to dive deeper into and since in january there weren't that many changes i want to focus on one specific change that is a bigger one and that is that android studio hedgehog is now stable so we got a new android studio version um strictly speaking that was released on december 26th but that was already after i recorded the last android news episode so in this video i will go over all important changes in this new android studio update and show you how you can use our IDE much more efficiently from now on. First of all, there were updates in the App Quality Insights tab. So we can now see our App Quality Insights directly inside of Android Studio. So these insights are just metrics that normally Google Play tracks for us and that we would only see in our Google Play console. But now we can see these directly in Android Studio. So if you have an app published in Google Play, you can now go to View, Tool Windows, App Quality Insights, and then this very first window that opens up here, you can see the Android vitals. Here you can then connect your Google Play console and you will see all important infos directly in Android Studio. So these could, for example, be crash logs and stack traces. So you can directly inspect what went wrong for your users when the app crashed. The next little change are enhancements to the App Links Assistant. What is the App Links Assistant? That is just another tool window inside of Android Studio where we can just manage our deep links that we have in our app. And we can also, first of all, create these. We can also find this window by going to View, Tool Windows, and then opening this App Links Assistant. Then this App Links Assistant window will open up and you can see in this app that I've opened here, I already have two deep links installed, which you can see both here and the changes now that we have an, kind of an auto checker if these deep links are configured correctly. And if we take a look here in the right column, app check failures, then you can see both of these have one failure. And if we double click on one, then we can also see what the failure is. So there is just something that is wrong in our setup for these deep links. In this case, we're missing this Android auto verify attribute. And if we now want to fix that, we can simply click fix app check failures and this auto verify attribute here is added automatically. We can also do this for the other deep link. If we then go back to links and check here, you can see now we have zero app check failures for this link. For the other one, we still have one. We can also double click on that, fix app check failures. And there we go. Now all of our deep links are actually fine. So also pretty cool little change if you're using a lot of deep links in your app. Next up, there are changes to our power profiler in Android Studio. So how we can track the power usage of our app over a period of time. So previously, we could just go to View, Tool Windows, and then Profiler. Oh, where is it? Right here. So click on Profiler. Then this Profiler window will open up and make sure you have an, an opened app. And previously, we could see our energy, our power profiler also down here. So we just see the graph in this case for memory usage, for CPU usage, so how, how much CPU resources our app eats, how much memory it eats, but also how much the power consumption is at a given time. Now that changed. So the energy profile has moved, you can see, and we now need to use the system trace feature in order to see energy data. And we can actually only see energy data if we click record. So we have to record all these um, all that information over a given time frame. So we then have to hit record. We need to do something where we want to inspect the energy usage off, and then we can stop recording and inspect all the details. And I want to just try this out to show you how this works. Let's hit record. We can then shrink this down a little bit. Here I have my app open. And if we now click save, then a network request will actually be fired. And that should make our, our energy usage, uh, usage spike a little bit. So let's do that. And after a little moment, hopefully this succeeds. But it also doesn't matter if this succeeds. We can also just hit stop because you can see something happened there. I will minimize this here. Seems like some slow connection. It's parsing. And now we can see all the details here and actually a little bit more details than we could see previously with the, um, with the older energy profiler. So if we now take a look here on the power rails, we can now see a very detailed breakdown which parts of the device consumed how much energy. So for example, the display consumed 310 milliwatt 
in this given um, recorded time frame. And we can see how much memory our, our small CPU consumed, how much our big CPU consumed cellular, so uh, the, the network connection, how much our RAM actually consumed our uh, mid-level CPU or GPU. So that is just how you can now inspect your, your app's energy usage much better, I think. You can still dive very deep into this, which thread ate how much memory and all that stuff. Um, but usually what is most important to you is just to have a very easy to scan breakdown of where the bottlenecks are and what causes high energy consumption. So you can work on that. And I think this new power rails window here, which I think wasn't there before, now uh, gives quite a good breakdown. Next up, we have my favorite changes in this version and all these affect the Jetpack Compose preview. Anyone who used Jetpack Compose in the past months and years knows that the preview was everything but ideal. But it is actually improving and it's getting quite some cool features. You can see I have a preview open of my translator app screen, which I built in my KMM course. And normally if we change something in our UI tree, like uh, for example, we scroll up and maybe add some kind of text here, maybe at the top, text. And then we say, hello world or so, then this will reload in real time. Always take a little moment, but you can see there's our hello world text. Now, one change is that we can open the Android Studio settings and we can search for manual live edit. Then go to live edit. And here we can now see these new changes in Android Studio Hedgehog that we can now disable that the preview will automatically update. That is especially helpful when it's uh, quite slow and laggy that you first want to write some changes to your UI component and then deploy these to the uh, preview view which you can now do by clicking this push edits manually on save, hitting OK. If we then remove this text again, then the preview won't update automatically. But when I hit save, then it should actually update. Yes, now it's updating. You can see loading and the hello world text should be removed again. So that was one change to the preview, which I think is helpful if you have a slower machine and that might be a little bit laggy or you're just annoyed by all these frequent updates to the preview or if the preview just keeps on breaking because you write some code, which of course initially isn't syntactically correct, but Compose still tries to preview syntactically incorrect code. But what is much cooler now, a much cooler change is if we go to our Gradle file and you make sure to use at least this version of the UI tooling preview dependency, so at least 1.6.0, and we go down to our preview, then we have access to a new set of annotations for a preview. Because in the past, it has always been a pain to preview our UI components on different configurations, on different screen sizes, with a different font scaling. For each of these, we, we would need to actually have a, a separate preview function here and then configure that in this preview annotation. So here we have access to all the parameter infos. So you can see we have a name, we have uh, the width of our device, the height of our device, the locale and show system UI. We have a UI mode. Yes, UI mode is I think uh, dark and light theme. So for all that we have options to configure that here. That is nothing new. But if we now want to preview our screen on tablet devices, on mobile devices, maybe on landscape mode, then we need to have a separate preview for each of these. And that is now over. Because now with this new dependency we just added, we have access to four more important annotations we can apply to our preview. On the one hand, preview, screen sizes. If we apply that, then you could see Android Studio will automatically show the preview on all different screen sizes we would want to test our app on. So if we now go to the big preview tab, you can see we have a tablet version here. In landscape mode, we have our phone version, we have our phone version in landscape, we have our tablet in our landscape, which is a bit a smaller tablet. We have our tablet on an unfolded foldable and again on a little bit smaller screen here. So with one annotation, we now got all these previews for our same component on different screen sizes and we can now perfectly see where issues are and where we still need to make this more responsive. In this case, this was only a mobile optimized layout, as you can see. So on tablet, it looks pretty ugly. But when building a production app that could be potentially used on tablet devices, then you of course want to make sure that your app is also responsive and ideally also optimized for tablets. But apart from this screen size annotation, we also have more. So if we duplicate this and call this preview font scale, then we can also see in addition that Android Studio will generate different font scales for our preview. So different sizes of the fonts, if 
we now scroll down, you can see here we have translate um, a text a little bit smaller. Here's a little bit larger, larger, and even larger. You can see it's it's just increasing the font on all of our different preview sizes, which is of course a setting the user could pick on their device. And so many developers just don't take care of that, that this even exists, that users could increase the font size because they just test it on their device, they have their fixed font size, and as long as it looks good on their device, they will be fine. But especially if you're maybe building an app for an older audience, then that older audience oftentimes has a large font scaling set in their settings, and then you need to make sure that your app also looks fine on that font scale. Okay, what else do we have here? We can also have a preview light dark annotation and a preview dynamic colors preview dynamic colors annotation and both these should be self-explanatory so light dark will obviously also add light and dark theme to our preview you can see here's our dark theme variant our light theme variant and you can see it adds dynamic colors to our preview here well, um, when I built this app, there weren't dynamic colors yet, so that was still with Material 2, and dynamic colors is a Material 3 thing. But if you're building a Material 3 app and you want to see how your app looks like with a different dynamic color setups, then you can also use this notation to see it in blue, see it in green, red, yellow, and not sure what that is. I think that's just a default preview. So now we can just have a single preview, just a single preview function. We add all these annotations, and then we see, pretty easy to scan here, all different variants, how that looks like on uh, each device type. And I think this will really be the point where I start to use the preview more compared to different emulators. In the past, I always liked using emulators kind of more than using the preview because uh, changes were built as fast as the preview rebuild and deploying an app to an emulator or real device just broke less often than the preview and compose. But I think this is a change that no real device or emulator can, can offer that e easily. So I will definitely use this in future for my project. Another change for this multi-compose preview is that we have a new gallery mode. So if we go to this little icon here, we can see or we can select how we want this preview to be rendered. If we select list, then we see it all in a list. But we also have a new gallery mode. If we open that, then you can see we have one preview per screen, basically. So here with the, uh, the desktop preview, the phone one, phone landscape. So if you want to inspect these in an isolated manner, you might also want to check that new gallery mode. So much for the preview. Another cool change for Compose is that there were improvements to the Compose debugger. So if we want to debug something in our Jetpack Compose code, if we do that somewhere here, maybe just a sort of breakpoint next to drop down menu, and then we debug our app, then as soon as that opens, obviously this breakpoint will trigger since this co compose code is executed. I just want to resume this twice to show you what I mean, and actually multiple times until it doesn't complain anymore. And if we now trigger this code again by changing the state, so this is just the language dropdown, so one of these drop down items here in the top. And if, if I click on that, then the dropdown will open. Therefore, the state will change that the dropdown is now open. And that state change will again trigger a recomposition here in our composable. And the change is now that if I click on this, then our code will trigger. And now we see in, in yellow, orange highlighted, which parameters actually changed for this composable. So for example, the is open boolean was now set to true because now the dropdown is open. And if we click resume, then click resume again, for some reason, it was triggered again. But if we now select a different language, like French, for example, then this will trigger again. You can see now this was called with the UI language French, and this open is now false, since after this click, this dropdown will be hidden again. So I think that's also a pretty cool change if you are debugging your compose code. Next up, we have one more change related to our device mirroring inside of Android Studio. So right here, we can now enable this hardware input forwarding. I'm not fully after what this will change yet, but I can certainly show you some changes that will take effect when we click on this and enable this hardware input forwarding. And that is that in our connected device, we can now kind of also forward keyboard shortcuts to just use this emulator more efficiently. So if we hit Command B, for example, then we will switch to the browser or Command N will open the notifications tray. So this has something to do with how your keyboard and mouse input is forwarded to the device that you're connected with. Because if I turn this off and go back to my app, hit Command B again, 
then nothing will actually happen because this input forwarding is turned off. I'm pretty sure this also has some, some other use cases which I'm just not aware of yet, but since there's a change, I wanted to include it here. And last but not least, the last cool change that also affects this running devices window is that we now have an embedded layout inspector here. So we have an additional icon, this one here, toggle layout inspector. You will only have this if you enable this because I think it's still experimental. So if we open the Android Studio settings, then go to experimental layout inspector and then enable the embedded layout inspector. You need to restart in studio, but after that, you will also have this icon. If we click this and just make this a bit bigger, for some reason it's disconnected, but then you can see we have an, a layout inspector directly embedded here into our real device and so we can still kind of control our device inside here and then see how these changes and recompositions affect our layout inspector. So if we now click on English, select a new language, then you will see that um, we have our new compose hierarchy here. So for each language item, we can we can see that here in our UI tree, we can see which composable recompose, how often we can see the skipped count. So everything just like in the normal layout inspector with the difference that we can control our device right next to this. If you're not seeing the recomposition counts, you would need to enable these here, show recomposition counts. But other than that, I think that's pretty cool, especially because we can now use this app here directly inside of Android Studio and see all the changes and debug information right next to it. So which of the changes did you actually like the most and which of these will you use the most in future? I'd be very interested in hearing your views and your opinions about these so just let us know that down below and other than that thanks so much for watching this video i will see you back in the next one have an amazing rest of your week bye bye